first thing, if, before I start, you, you know you're going to substitute the front is I've Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Also, so everyone, everyone, everyone has that in common. Oh, perfect. Um, or pretty much everyone. Excellent. Um, and my name is Adam, and um, my 9 to 5, I'm actually a lawyer, but I have a CS background at my hat stuff. Perfect. A lawyer hacker. You won't get there's, to yeah, there's a lot of them around here. <laughs> EFF is based not half a mile away. Excellent. I'd like to know that I don't know something is any anyone of you is a designer? By the way, hi, I'm John. Freddy. How's it Freddy? No? No one's a designer, but I guess most of you know how to program, right? Does anyone doesn't have a clue about programming? No? So they saw this. Do you know you know what's a variable? A what? Yeah. A variable. A variable. Oh, yeah. Variable. Yeah? yeah? A condition? And a cycle? Yeah. That's mostly all that you need. Alright, cool. Perfect. So, what about you? Can you tell us a little bit of yourself? Yeah. Hi, Bob. I need to let you guys know something because you're new to the space. Yeah. If, yeah. You're going to, if you're going to film, you want to announce to everybody at the space that you're going to take pictures and ask if they don't want to be photographed. Oh, perfect. It's just a protocol thing, and they'll, they'll, always, they'll usually be nice and say, please don't. Sorry, we didn't know that. that. Oh, perfect. Thanks to Tim. So we want to we want to record this. If it's okay with you, and if anybody's not interested in being in the picture, we can just put the guys on the back. So we have. I don't want to put that. Okay. You are not even in the frame. Don't worry. I just thought I'd let you know what I saw. No, 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 perfect, perfect. We really love that. It's cool. Okay, so we're just gonna do a, a little. It's mostly the camera is focused on us. That's it. Okay. Awesome. So a lot of people don't mind. So. Okay, perfect. But it's uh, good to ask. Excellent. You were telling me the other day. Oh yeah. Um, I know a little bit. My name is Alan, I'm an unemployed business marketing strategy kind of person, and I'm just curious about how this technology can forward some of your proposals. Excellent. All right. Uh, Shin, now I'm a software engineer. I'm actually the, used to be back in coding, and now I've been doing mostly mobile development. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. How about you? Uh, my name is James. I guess I'm kind of an aspiring developer. I, I also work in the law office, but not as a lawyer. I do administrative stuff. And so I've been going to Noise Bridge and just trying to learn everything I can about what technologies. Excellent. How about you? Um, I'm a bit like that guy over there, business guy. I'm just starting to develop. So. Excellent. Want to tell um, a little bit? I'm involved in most of the Linux classes that happen here. And uh, some, of the, some of them are sysadmin, and the one that Jim just started a C class. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty much around the space all the time. Um, Nathan, um, I do some web development and uh, a little design, but more of uh, HTML, CSS. Uh, otherwise, I work at uh, the metal shop. Improving it, 
as I said, were bad with names. And we created a little show. Hi, hello. Go ahead. We created a little show called Improving the Web, Mejorando la Web. Uh, we, do, we do this web show live every Thursday. Uh, in here will be around 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Pacific time. We talk about what's happening on the web, what's changing, what's important, what doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my Twitter account is this one, and I don't look like my avatar at all. It's called Freddy R, and his Twitter account is Sivani, because you use Twitter, so you can follow us. And we love feedback a lot. Normally, we do this in Spanish, this is the first time that I'm doing it in English, uh, so if I say something weird, or if I make a mistake, please, please laugh. That way I know I made a mistake and I will learn. All right, so as I said, we love feedback, we love to know if we're doing it right, we're doing it wrong, if, for example, we're doing something that goes against Noise Bridge, which to me is one of the coolest places in the world. Uh, and it's really a great honor to be here. Thank you to Jeffrey, who is not here with us. He's in vacation, yay for him. Uh, but I'm feeling for him right now. So, if, if, does anybody of you use Twitter, maybe? Anyone? Who uses Twitter? One, two, three, four, etc. All right, so if you use Twitter, please tweet with our hashtag. It's Mejorandola. I know it sounds weird if you do it in English, but if you send us a tweet telling us what you think, if you want to scream to us, something like that, please do. That way we will know what you think about it. All right, so I'd like, Christian, please go ahead with what we, we, we do in Latin America, America, and I'll start with the technical part. So basically we thought, when we, when we heard about this HTML5 technology, we were in the web working for a lot, for a lot of time, and we decided to teach people to use HTML5, and we like, we like the marketing part of it. I mean, we're into technology, we, love, we like to program, we like to use all these new tags and all these new technologies and everything, but we really think that this new logo and all this branding that there's behind the technology is actually making it pretty good. When we were speaking with Jeffrey last, last time, he told us that you guys are, are, are very into the technical stuff. We like that. But we also like to empower people through HTML5, teaching them and help them then to build stuff from, uh, from, the, uh, from online. To the, to the web, and HTML5 also is joining both uh, development for computers and mobile. We love, we love that interaction. So we've been teaching HTML5 all over. We already have been uh, teaching at least uh, 3,000 people all over the world to use HTML5, and what we're trying to build is a little community that will get together around the world so people can use uh, HTML5 to present their projects. So, the most important thing about HTML5 and what we hate about it is that people is selling it like this is the future. This is what you have to use for your next product, product and everything. We don't think that. I think HTML5, it's right now. We ha you have to use it and you have already uh, know all the technologies for a while. Uh, we like HTML5 because all the big companies are into this movement. For the first time you have a technology and it's not pro pro proprietary, not just one company is using it, but all, everybody is promoting it through their browsers, through their experiments. We love what Google is doing. Last week they have the Google I.O. and they're basically telling how cool their new browser is, how you can use it everywhere, and how HTML5 is their way to develop for the web and for mobile and for everything. So Google is oh, doing sorry. a lot. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Google is doing a lot of stuff. There's another company that we don't really like that much. I hope there's nobody here with, that works with them. Uh, <laughs> that also is doing a great commitment through HTML5. Their new browser is kind of cool. I, I guess nobody uses here Internet Explorer or Words on Microsoft. We like to do that disclaimer because we like to do kind of a little joke switch with their technologies. <laughs> so, but they're doing actually pretty good things. Uh, if you are into Japanese anime, they are doing a lot of uh, technologies, web, WebDL, uh, Canvas. Sorry? SVG, SVG animation. Ah, an SVG animation. And they're using this for the browser, so there's also art coming to HTML5 to the browser and Internet Explorer. Microsoft doing pretty cool stuff. Apple is, of course, one of the companies that is moving HTML more forward because they started moving all these new mobile platforms, the iPad, the iPhone, and everything. And they decided to quit previous technologies that we used to develop, like every all the Adobe Flash platform. So they were the first to quit and say, move forward with HTML5. There's another company, Firefox, that we like a lot, the Mozilla Foundation in, uh, also, and they are doing a big effort to promote HTML5 as their new technology to promote this stuff. One of the companies that we 
have there. Opera, anybody around here uses Opera? Opera software, yeah, to test or to as, as your regular browser, by any chance? Yeah. We have, we have an issue with that, you know, it's like only these Europeans in Scandinavia are using Opera highly, but we love what they're doing and watching the improvements of the Opera uh, browser, you can see how the web is going to move forward for the future. And also even Adobe is, has all these tools, they're going to change the whole suite of tools that they use to develop to, uh, to paste information as HTML5. So we're kind of glad everybody's doing, also Amazon. If you are into the Kindle, the latest versions of Kindle are, have also some improvements and are using HTML5 to promote and sell their books also. Uh, Yahoo, another of, of the cool companies. I have trouble with, with Yahoo. Uh, they're going down as a company, but their team of engineers are actually pretty cool and are releasing all these amazing frameworks with cocktail names uh, that you can use to actually build stuff with HTML. So those are all the companies. Ah, yeah, Facebook. Facebook is also doing a lot of stuff. Facebook uh, has uh, this website where you can actually see all the development tools that they have forward uh, towards HTML5 and Twitter. Uh, Twitter has one of the coolest frameworks to start a, a web project right now that is called Bootstrap. So they will give you this framework that you can use to actually start a new project, have the design and the platform. So, the main message here is HTML5, any, uh, all the companies are pushing HTML5. Even the companies that you won't, won't think that, that they are going to push it. For example, Adobe. Uh, everybody thought Flash was going to, well, Flash used to be the crown of Macromedia. Then Adobe bought Macromedia and Flash went to hell. Uh, marketing wise, Flash is still an incredibly cool technology. And inside Adobe, they are hardly working on making the Flash tool. Uh, export to HTML5. It's not there yet, but everybody's pushing HTML5 forward. And that's a pretty good message for, uh, for us as developers. Because HTML5 is not something that's going to happen. It already happened. It's already in its peak, and it's something that really everybody that is on the web should learn. So, the first thing that I want to say is that HTML5 isn't new. HTML5 is not a new technology. I remember talking with friends in 2005 about why the article tag sucks, for example. It doesn't. But that friend thought it sucked. Uh, there's a lot of things in HTML5 that have been in the works for a long, long time. It's just that the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, is really slow in implementing new technologies. HTML5 happened when all these companies decided, hey, web, let's push it there. Uh, for example, anybody here remember Google Wave? Yeah? I know, I know in the valley you say Google Wave and there's like this dark... Uh, but Google Wave, actually, it was, it was an incredible product. It was ahead of its time. It has the weirdest user experience ever, but it had a lot of good ideas. HTML, uh, Google Wave had the drag and drop files, the web sockets, and a lot of those technologies found their way to the browser. It happened in Gmail, it happened in a lot of products. So, HTML5 is new, and let me, let me demonstrate that. This is, for example, HTML4, and I hope everybody knows this. HTML4 is uh, the original tags, you have at, uh, H2. Ah, oh, I didn't translate this, I'm very sorry. But you also learn in Spanish, so this is a combo. Uh, H2, H2 is the basic title, and I don't know if you know, but you never, never, never should do more than one H1. H1 is just one, it doesn't matter what the W3C says, they're crazy. H1, it's, uh, it's one of the highest semantic tags that you have in the web. If you do more than one, you dilute the value of the H1 if you're doing search engine optimization. So you shouldn't use more than one. <coughs> anyway, H2 is a title, the title of an article, for example. Uh, P is, what, what's P? Paragraph, obviously, cool. A strong, a strong, it used to be B, bold, but HTML from, uh, since, H since XHTML, you shouldn't combine design with HTML, never, ever. And that's why you don't have B as bold, you have strong, because strong is an emphasis. Um, talking about emphasis, there's emphasis, which do italic, but that's just visual. It's the default visuals of the browser. You never should do design in HTML. That's what Cascade Style Sheets CSS is for. So, this is HTML4. Are you ready to see the incredible chain of HTML5? Okay, look quite closely. This is HTML4, and this is HTML5. <laughs> it's a radical change. <laughs> HTML5 and HTML4 are basically the same. You have the same tags, you have the same content, you have the same CSS, you have the same scripts, you have the same everything. It's just that you have some new tags. Let's talk about them. 
the first batch of new tags are the boring tags. The tags that they say, oh yeah, good. That some people use, some people don't use should. And they are the semantic tags. They are header, age group, section, article, aside, and footer. Header is obviously for verb header, right? But you have section and article. A lot of people think that section is uh, the thing that came to replace div. Did you say div? Yeah, All right. I'm learning English, it's a triple combo. Uh, div is the typical box, that's it. But section is also a box, so what do I do, section or div? It depends. If you're, if you're dividing content uh, semantically, uh, it means if that content has a different meaning than this content, then you divide it with section. But if it's just visual, if I'm just gonna put, I don't know, a shadow or something like that, then I should use div. Then we have article. Let's have, for example, a, a blog, the homepage of a blog. If you have 10 articles on the homepage, you have 10 article tags, right? So here's a question for you. What if I have, what if I'm in a blog post and I have one article, ah, by the way, this is controversial and the World Wide Web Consortium is full of these kind of discussions. What if I have one blog post and 10 comments? How many article tags should I have there? Right. So there's a lot of there, there's a lot of options. You may have eleven because there are ten comments and one post. You may have two because you have the post and the comments, or you may have something else. So let's let, let's vote. But just one condition. I know you don't like conditions because Jay know it, right? but it's a little one. Please please vote because if you don't make mistakes, you will never learn. It's important to make mistakes. And don't vote one if you can. All right. So who uh, any of you? Who thinks it's 10? 10 article tags. Nobody? No? Not you? Alright. 11. Most of you. Something else that is not 9 or 11, 9 or 10. Alright. Actually, you actually spoke about the, the distribution that you're going to have one article for the article, for the, for the, for the contents, and another for the comments. Who is. Oh, yeah. Who's with two? Sorry. <laughs> two article tags. Alright. Semantically wise, you should have two sections. One section for the blog post. One section for the comments, because they are two, two sections in the very meaning of the word. And me, and that's personally me, but that's how a lot of people I've seen uh, are doing it, I will do 11 article tags. One for the blog post and one for each comment, because article is about independent areas of content. For example, you have, you have the blog post, that's a section, but in the section you have the article where the content of the post is, because in a, in a blog design you can have a lot of things. You have the tweet, Facebook, Google+, Plus, all those user buttons over there and things that nobody clicks. And you also have the, uh, the comment form, which, which is a form tag, and you have the comments. The comments are unique areas of content, are areas of independent content, so you do one article tag for each one of them. We also have a site. A site is a common misconception between my Latin American students because they think that it's called a site, so it has to be on one of the one of the sites. You don't have to be. You don't have to do it like that. A site is for all the content that you need to put in the web page, but you, uh, that content should not be the main objective of the page. For example, if you are in a newspaper and you probably have economy indicators like. How's the dollar doing? How's the euro doing? Etc. That's on the homepage, but that's probably not the main objective of that page. The main objective is to tell you the news. So you can put that in on a side, but it can be on the side, it can be down, it can be up. It doesn't matter visually because you never should do design in HTML. Uh, design is for CSS. So a side is for all the content that you don't want, but that you need to put there. A site has another useful function. In Opera Mini, uh, Opera Mini is incredibly popular in the mobile world. Uh, in Opera Mini, Opera analyzes the websites and when it sits on a site, it deletes. It deletes the, the tag because uh, it's not important and you're in a small screen. So, it, so that's why it, do, it, it does that. All right, we have H group. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Quick question before you keep uh, on going. I was wondering, can you, uh, can you share this presentation with Oh, of course. So uh, like maybe take notes with it instead of that. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give you my email at the end of the presentation. If you say, hey, can you give me the presentation, I'll, I'll take it to you, and we also have a form. If you fill the form, we will give you the presentation, no problem, okay. because there's no other way to contact your guests. Or if you bring me a USB, I will give it to you right now. Yes? Or you can just put it up on our wiki. 
or I can just put that on the wiki. <laughs> it's just that Rolf told me that nobody reads the wiki. Yeah. Some people do. Some people do. So you do. So I put it on the wiki. I do everything. I swear. <laughs> All right. Uh, each group. Each group is a tag that can, in theory, the W3C says you can put as much H1, H2, or H3 you want because each group is for a group of headers and not the header tag but the H, H1, H2, H3. That's what W3C says. But uh, search engine optimization guys tend to abuse these kind of capabilities. So Google, for example, in search engine experiments, uh, we've seen that Google ignores that. If you, if you do a lot of H groups, Google just dilute the value of the H1. And that's not what you want when you're doing search engine optimization. So my advice is don't use it. One, one quick note about search engine optimization, and we, it matters that much to us. Uh, we work a lot with Spanish developers, and Spain is one of the markets where they do the most hard experiments on search engine optimization. Actually, some of the engineers at Google have said that you have to be uh, careful with Spaniards, because they will test the the browser, they will try to hack the results and stuff like that. So we end up uh, receiving a lot of a lot of input about uh, search engine optimization. That when we share with the with the American market, people tend to tell us like, "Hey, how do you learn about that?" Well, Spaniards are pretty good at it. You know, they're always trying to get the best positions, mostly because they they are one of the biggest travel destinations in the world, and they want to make sure that people from the U.S gets to their places first, you know? So it's it's part of the market and it's pretty interesting why we ended up with this knowledge. And they just beat Italia 4-0. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and they won the Euro Cup, exactly. Yeah, is that also? No, actually. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. <laughs> is the tag actually H group or is that a shorthand way of saying H1, H2? No, it's H group. It's H group. Sorry, it's not that clear. In H group? The, the tag is called H group. You put an H group and inside you put H1, H2, H3. And then you can, in theory, repeat that in another place, H1, H2, H3. Yeah. And it will count as a single... In theory, that's what the W3C okay. says. Right. But the browsers don't care about that, mostly. Uh, um, yeah. And as, and as he said, it's because a lot of search engine optimization guys have been abusing this. In fact, just as a little note, Spain is the only country in the world where the Google Doodles do nothing. If you click them, they don't go anywhere. Because the Spanish SEOs uh, got a list of patterns that Google made when they do the Google Doodles, and they all the, all the years try to put their websites first. So there's a lot of cases where, for example, it's the third day of Nikola Tesla. So in Spain, you click Nikola Tesla, and in Google.es, the Google Spain, you go to somewhere else, totally different. Because they've been trying for years to be the first, because the Google Doodles move a lot of crap. Anyway, <laughs> carrying on, uh, at the end of it, we have the Fuller tag. The Fuller tag is a footer. Questions about the Fuller tag? Amazing tag, no? Cool, all right. This is not why most people want to run HTML5. This is the first draft of HTML5, which is the first thing you use by people today. HTML5 should be fun because div doesn't mean anything. But the reason why is because of all these guys. Everybody's saying HTML5 is cool because you can do animation, you can do video, you can do SVG, you can do 3D, you can do geolocation, you can do a lot of cool things and a lot of scary things with HTML5. And let's talk about it. The first one, the thing that most people are interested about is in video and audio. Video and audio are very controversial areas of HTML5 because here we see something that I'm really sad about. I'm not sure if there's any other country besides the US that have this thing called software patents. And I hope I don't get deported because of this, but software patents kind of suck. Because they, they, they are the idea that you can patent ideas. And it's kind of silly. Uh, in the software patent world, you have video and audio, and, and this affects a lot of the web. And there's two standards right now fighting for who will be the TV standard of the web. The first one is H.264, MP4. The, uh, that standard is from a group called the MPEG LA group. The MPEG LA group is a lot of people, mostly Hollywood studios and certain technological companies, mainly Microsoft and Apple. They share the patents for H.264. So if you want to do something that does that, for example, codes or decodes H.264, you need to pay a lot of money to them, a lot of money. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Macromedia used to pay 80 million dollars to be able, I think, I'm not sure, please google it, 
but I think it was around 80 million dollars to to be able to reproduce to play H.264 in the Flash Player. That's uh, that's why it exists. There's this uh, open source project called H.264. H.264 does a coding on the coding of the H.264 videos, but without using any patterns. It's quite hard. You need to do reverse engineering and things like that. You need to be sure you don't touch any of their patterns or any of their licensed ideas uh, to be able to reproduce it. It's quite hard, but there's a lot of pro uh, projects that are doing it. Video, for example, video H.264 only works in Google Chrome, Internet Explorer 9, and Safari, Internet Explorer 9 and 10. If you're using Google Chrome, Firefox, or Opera, you won't be able to uh, play an H.264 MP4 video. Uh, Google bought a company called Onto. Onto was a very cool company related with Adobe they did the FLB codec, that the one that it was that it used to be used in YouTube. Uh, Google bought it, and they were they were developing internally a codec way more advanced than H.264. It's called BP8, and, uh, and Google developed a container for that. In video, you have two things: a container is like the place where you put the video, the audio, the subtitles, and everything else, and you have the codec. It's the way that you compress and decompress the video. Uh, in, in, in the H.264 world, the code is called H.264, the container is called MP4, you know that. Um, Google created WebM and released it to the public and promised, pretty promised, that they will never patent that. They, will re they release everything in the legal way so that nobody will patent that kind of idea. Uh, BP8 as well. So you have an open source open code called BP8 free, royalty free, blah blah blah, uh, BP8 and WebM, the container, and those are the two that are fighting. Obviously, H.264 is winning, and it's winning hard. And there's a reason for that, and it's mobile. In the mobile world, you have a ship. There's a ship solely dedicated to decode H.264. That's why you can see a video on YouTube, but if you see something else, for example, you try to play a Flash Player video on Android, it will suck, because that goes to the CPU, to the processor. But if you see a video, and it's H.264, it goes to the ship. And the ship is way more efficient, it doesn't heat, it, it, it needs less battery, it's way more efficient. Simple as that. So the developers tend to say, screw it, I'm going to use H.264, the hell with BPA. Uh, but people, real professional people, are doing it in all the way. For example, YouTube codes all the videos that it does in all the codecs that it can, even in 3GP, so they can be played in really, really old Nokia's or Blackberries. Right? And in the audio, the audio always uh, also go to hell because MP3 has always been a sad story and they have OGG and blah blah blah. Videos, video right now is way more important. And audio, audio has another problem in the HTML5 world. Uh, it's that you only can play one channel at a time. So if you want to do a video game and you have background music and you want to do pew 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 sounds, uh, you need to do an iframe. That's not elegant at all. And, it, and it's the only way right now. I don't want to be sad, this is the only sad story, believe me, the rest is awesome. One, one thing, and why this is important, we like to talk about the patterns and software here, because for example, there's a lot of people coming into the HTML5 world to develop video games, you know, and there's a lot of nice frameworks to develop video games that are available freely on the web. But if you're using MP3s, audios for your video games, and you become pretty successful, expect, expect as some company to sue you <laughs> over that. You know, so it's important to know. Unless, unless, unless you buy a license and blah blah blah. And that's the thing, you can buy the license and everything, but the whole path over there is something that we don't usually know. It's just like, ah, MP3, I recorded that, I put it on my game and it's ready to go, and it's ready to ship. But you also have to think about the legal aspect of all this. All right. Why don't they put the other uh, codec in the chip too? Uh, because this is not as nice as well as it's, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> BP, BP, no, nobody knew about BP8 until Google bought on two. I, I mean, everybody knew that a lot of companies were uh, were working on developing a better codec, a better video codec. But on two, uh, uh, BP8 was the secret of on two. Then Google came and said, "Hey, here's a bag of money. Give us everything." And then they released it. Uh, BP8 is a really nice codec, but it's really recent. I think it was at the end of 2010 that they managed to release it. And fabrication of chips is quite hard. And, and Google has the power, but Google is not the only player. Google, not, Google doesn't develop uh, their own phones. 
they, are, they always contract Samsung, Asus, blah, 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 to do it. And obviously they go to the cheaper provider. And uh, as far as I know, there's no BPA chip right now, only H.264. There's, there, it's, it's, it's complicated in the hardware world. Hopefully it will be brighter in the future. But right now, if you want to make a video that everybody will see, you need to do an H.264 version and a BPA version. As a web developer, you don't need to pay anything. The browsers already paid to be able to play those videos. Well, Microsoft and Apple didn't because they own the licenses, but the rest of them did. All right. Are yeah. You, sure, sorry. You said it fucked up on an Android because it goes to the CPU. That would be void if you run your browser in the memory, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. But it would be slower. Right. And it will spend more battery. It depends, obviously. In the future, it won't matter because we will have better processors, better battery. I hope, oh God, I need better batteries in my life. Uh, so if you have that, yeah, it won't matter. All right. Now let's talk about nice things. Canvas and SVG. SVG is scalable vector graphics, and Canvas is the thing that kills Flash. Canvas is, uh, is a way in JavaScript, JavaScript is the language of the web, in case you don't know, Canvas is the way to do graphics, to do some kind of animation, to draw, to do effects, to bitmaps. Canvas is quite cool. And it's really mature. Uh, I've been doing this presentation for the last two years, and when I started, I said, yeah, Canvas is working, but it's really mature. There's not a lot of frameworks. But right now, there's a lot of frameworks, and it's incredibly awesome. You can do a Photoshop-like thing with Canvas. Canvas is really, really powerful. You can do bitmap manipulation. There's a lot of algorithms applied to Canvas, and it's all JavaScript, and it runs on everything. You have examples of Canvas uh, projects that run on a really old Android, or an iPhone, or an iPad, or on any tablet that supports HTML5. And SVG is scalable vector graphics, and a lot of companies are pushing SVG. SVG has never been cool because you had to do vector graphics in text, in XML text, the worst kind of text. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of love for XML, I prefer JSON, but that's for the techie ones. Uh, SVG right now has a lot of support, from Adobe especially. Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign, uh, Adobe Flash, they all support export to SVG. So SVG has a lot of future. Christian, uh, Christian told a little bit about a project from Internet Explorer 9. Uh, Microsoft hired a Japanese animator to do an animation up, uh, all vector based and they transform that animation to SVG and you can play it on the Internet Explorer 9 browser or actually in any browser at all, any, any modern browser. And that's important because scalable vector graphics are scalable and are really, really tiny. They, they, they have a little, uh, a, a little size, in byte wise and you can program them. So for example, in this example of Internet Explorer 9, you could change the colors of everything. If you wanted the, the character in the animation to have pink or the green skin, or you wanted to change the hair, you could do it in real time while the animation was developing, and it happened. That was pretty cool. Actually, what was the name of the project? I don't remember. No, good. But if you Google anime, anime girl uh, Internet Explorer, and you happen to have a copy of Internet Explorer 9, uh, or, any, or any sensitive browser, don't do that, don't listen to me. <laughs> don't touch the blue E. Uh, but, but if you do, I, I mean, it works in any browser, I do it. Alright, now, local storage and web SQL. Well, web SQL is a sad story, but local storage isn't. Local storage is, uh, is a way to store the stuff on the browser, on the hard drive of the user. And it works like this. You, set, you, you, you literally write just this in, in JavaScript. Locker storage dot variable equals value. And you're done. You don't need to open file. You don't need to close file. You don't need to save anything. Local storage dot the name of the variable you're going to use equals the value, the, the content. And that's it. That's, that, that's everything. Local storage is incredibly easy. Incredibly easy. And it's really good and it has a lot of support. You can use it, uh, local storage since Internet Explorer 8. And, and the support is quite good and it's uniform. That never happens. Local storage is 5 megabytes in any browser. In any browser, even mobile browsers. Uh, it's also scary because nobody knows about local storage. When you do your cookies, you are not deleting the local storage. The only browser right now that has decent tools for deleting local storage is Chrome. There are browsers 
the kind of cookie stays there forever. Blueberry storage is way better than cookies as well. Uh, does anybody know how much can you store in a cookie? In bytes or kilobytes or megabytes? Nobody? No? Guess? How many do you guess? How much? 4K. 4K? Actually, that's the truth. 4K. But per cookie. In the whole, in, in all the cookies per domain, do you know how many? How much? Sorry? It's 11, no, it's 100, sorry, 100 kilobytes. That's nothing, right? 100 kilobytes, you can't store anything useful there. Well, marketing guys uh, have a lot of ways to store a lot of things there to track. And that's okay for some companies, that's not okay for other companies, that's not what matters. What matters is technical. Cookies travel in every HTTP request. If you have a website with five images, you do six HTTP requests, right? The HTML5 and the five images. If you have the 100 kilobytes full, you will do a 600 kilobyte request of uploading, not of downloading, so it's way slower. If you do a lot of cookies, you're gonna do a slow websites. A really slow websites. So when you're doing, when you're in a website and your website becomes slow, suddenly you say, why is this happening? is probably because you're using the session variables in PHP or you're doing, uh, you're overdoing the cookies. You should never do that because cookies are in every HTTP request because they go to the browser and blah, blah, blah. Session variables in PHP are alive. They are not really session variables in the server side. They are cookies that are transported in every, in every part of the browser, so don't do that. Local storage always stays in the hard drive, in the client side except if you don't want them to. You can, you can get local storage and send them to the server using Ajax, using WebSockets, using whatever you want. Then you have WebSQL. WebSQL just, use... Just one note about local storage. It's gonna, be, it's gonna become pretty important from now on local storage in the world, because I don't know if you guys heard that now Chrome is also available for iOS. Oh yeah, but did you hear? There's Chrome you for hear? iOS, iPad, iPhone. You can install Chrome now in your iPhone, in your iPad and everything. It's kind of cool if they're, 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 they're releasing it there. And it's also one of the top, top, top uh, free apps in the store right now. So a lot of people is gonna start using Chrome on their iPad and their, on their iPhones. But it's not actual Chrome, it's not the browser. They are using the Safari browser uh, because Apple has this rule that nobody can do another browser. For, for their for their software their hardware. Okay. So the, the thing here is that because they do that, the brand of Chrome is gonna be in more in more uh, in more hardware, but not the actual software. And when we're talking about local storage, the local storage that you have in Chrome running in iOS, you cannot delete it. So for example, if you go to the incognito mode that you have in Chrome in your iPad, people can actually track you. So the incognito mode in Chrome, in iOS, has uh, a sign and has a warning that it's not actual the uh, wildcard. A wildcard is not the same thing that you have on your computer. So a lot of developers are gonna start playing a lot with local storage now to bypass that little regulation that it's Yeah, uh, there's something else, uh, yeah? Can you give me an example of something that would be stored in local storage? You can store anything that you anything. can guess in five. Yeah, you are saying no, something. Yeah, you can. You can store anything at all. Anything you can serialize. You can, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm just beginning this. So by local storage, you mean data that's stored on your computer from session to session? Not exactly. Let me let me let me go check. So local storage it's a variable. It's just a little it's just a little object in JavaScript. You, you write local storage dot whatever you want. Local storage dot Freddy, right? Local storage dot Freddy equals, and in quotes, you can write lol, lol, right? That's it. When you do that, what the browser does is that it creates a folder in an encrypted, well, encrypted in a way, it, it just is a random, it random characters. It creates a folder, a secret folder, random characters, and it stores an, an archive uh, and it stores that, that local storage dot Freddy equals LOL, that's it, in some, some place. If you close your browser and you uh, shut down your computer, you turn it on again, you open the browser, it stays there because it's a file that it's on the hard drive. The only security that browsers do with local storage is that they randomize the name of the file. 
so that viruses or things like that can't access in theory. If you really are a dedicated virus writer, you can write a lot of code to access the, the RAM memory of the browser and get to know that the, that random name is not that hard. It's just a little bit harder. And most virus hackers are way more concerned with the low-hanging fruit to get there. Uh, but that's, that's all the security that local storage has. With the WebView thing in iOS, there's something else that Christian didn't mention. Uh, WebView is a component in, in iOS, Objective-C, to do a WebView in applications. So if you have, uh, if you use TripIt, you see sometimes an HTML5 little component, and that component has local storage. If TripIt, the application, stores something, and I open any other application at all, some application to see the soccer match, for example, and that uses a WebView, it will share the local storage. That never happens. In theory, local storage are per domain, per subdomain, and per browser, and per session. It, they, 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 they stay in the hard drive, but, but, but they, are, they, they have that security. You don't have that security in iOS. Yeah? I have a couple of questions. Uh, about local storage, okay, it's key value storage, right? Yeah, it's key value storage. Okay, second question. Uh, when I write some value in local storage, does it go directly into the hard drive, or it's actually like storing it in the RAM and gets dumped to the, to the hard drive? Like it depends on the browser. It used to be flush. It used to stay in RAM, and when you close the session, it will get flush. But in all the newer browsers that I'm aware of, it will get immediately to the hard drive. Okay. It also depends on how you configure it, too. Excuse me? It also depends on how you configure everything, too. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, you can, can you, you there's, it, if, if you're really advanced and a JavaScript hacker, there's a way to configure local storage to stay in RAM uh -huh. instead of going directly. That's good, I guess, because if you're writing a game or something that needs really fast access, like to the RAM, would be like the way to go. Yeah, yeah, there are ways. There are ways. I mean, I, I just teach you the most basic way to do local storage, but it's way more advanced than that. It has a whole API to do really advanced manipulation. Thank you very much. Any other question? No. Go to web. All right, web SQL. The sad story of the... No, let's not talk about sad things. <laughs> Web SQL is a sad story because of my Microsoft. Uh, Web SQL used to be a really nice thing. Everybody wanted Web SQL. And then the W3C. Sometimes the W3C is the light, the beacon of light that shows the web the way. And in other times, it's a lot of drunk guys throwing bugs. And this is one of those signs. Uh, Web SQL, uh, every, everybody was saying, hey, you should have a database in the browser. That's kind of a good idea. Yeah, let's do it. What, how, how, how should we do it? Let's do SQLite. Yeah, SQLite is the best database. And then Microsoft said, no. SQLite? No, 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 no. We need to use SQL Server. But SQL Server is huge. We will do SQL Server Lite. But what, when did you level that? Yeah, yes, yesterday. I leveled that yesterday. All right, then use Firebird. But no, Firebird is not, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of engines that want it to be the web, the web SQL engine. And if you, any of you have done database, you know that SQL is anything but a standard. There's the SQL that does uh, the single quotes, the double quotes, the quotes that are actually something else, and blah, blah, blah. SQL is not a standard at all. The only thing that's a standard about SQL is the select name. Uh, besides from that, there's a lot of weird SQL tags, there's a lot of weird SQL syntaxes. So if you have different engines for, for Web SQL, you, you will be crazy. You will need to create independent code for any of them. And uh, if you want to go backend in this situation, local storage is a lot like MongoDB, like NoSQL databases. And Web SQL are like traditional databases. In the client side, Web SQL, in my opinion, failed. And I don't think that's a discussion that's going to have a good ending anytime soon, sadly. Uh, it's not that sad, though. I don't think that you should have a whole database unless you're doing really weird stuff on the client side. I mean, backend is still the way to go for databases. Next, you have geoloc... Ah, I didn't translate that either. Sorry! Geolocation, touch events, and accelerometers. It's kind of the same. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite good. I think, I think you get it. And as I said, this is a combo. This is an HTML5 and a Spanish course. Uh, geolocation. Geolocation is amazing. Amazing. Geolocation. Actually, let me show you an example of geolocation. I'm going to go to Safari. Please don't crash. We use that machine for so many things. Yeah. 
Okay, Safari. Here's Safari. Please, please wait a little bit. All right, leave me. Here's Safari. All right, Safari. Jay, don't see that. This is a what? <laughs> see, that's why I don't do it like this. Okay, Ashro. Uh, I never, ever in my life had I. That, you know what's wrong? <laughs> I see a full bar, but check your connection just to say because it goes down here a lot. No, I mean the 5 gigahertz. I think I'm going to be paid. I hope I'm going to be paid. Mr.5demos.com. Please don't die. Please don't die. Please, please, please. I'm going to What the hell? Demo. Whatever, Google Maps. It won't fail me. So, you have Google Maps. Have you heard of this thing? It's amazing. <laughs> uh, Google Maps has... In English it's Google Maps too. Huh? In English it's Google Maps too. Wow! <laughs> Thank you! We are all learning! Alright, this is, this is the Google Maps of that guy. That guy travels a lot. That's why all the stars. And have you seen this button before? Maybe, yeah. This is the show my location button. If I click it, uh, I get this little message that says, Hey, these guys want to try your physical location so they can bomb you. Hello! And Tara, is this where North British? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna do magic tricks later. <laughs> so, how did this happen? How, how could my location be there? Probably some of you that are hardcore hackers already know, but in case you don't, let me explain magic to you. This is incredible to me. When I, when I heard about it first, I said, what the hell? It's an incredibly simple idea. It's really easy. It's as scary as hell, but at the same time, it's amazing. This is a normal MacBook Air. It doesn't have 3G, it doesn't have anything. In HTML5, you have a kind of GPA. For example, if you're doing it on a, on a phone, it's, this, is, this is quite easy in code as well. Uh, it's navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition. That's it. That's all the code. And then you get this immediately. You get latitude, longitude, and you don't, only, you don't only get that. You get a vector of movement. You get speed, you get acceleration, and you get direction. You see. 38 degrees north, for example. How does this work? If you're on a phone, and you do that on the browser on the phone, the phone will activate the GPS antennas and give you the latitude and longitude. That's easy, it's basically vectorial calculus. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. Some of you made faces when I said calculus. That's fine. Uh, if you don't have GPS, then you do a GSM triangulation, and it's really easy. Have you seen a GSM antenna, or a 3G antenna? They're quite hard to move and there's a public database of where they are. In, in phones, it's an hexa, hexadecimal number that identifies each antenna. So what the phone does is, uh, what's, what are the antennas that are near to me? These antennas, what's the power of each of one antenna? That's the power of that, power of that. So let's create circles. Let's see what's the intersection of all the circles. That's probably where the guy is. It's not that precise. It's between 100 and 500 meters of precision. You need a really big bomb to kill someone in that precision. Uh, uh, note, never say bomb in noise bridge. <laughs> no, it's probably because of the laptop. This laptop has a really small window of... You need, you need some power? I need some power, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. No, no. All right, I hope you're enjoying this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, going on. So, GSM antennas. You, you, uh, and what I'm saying here is that it doesn't matter if your phone is really cheap. A lot of people can track you through the phone. In fact, there's several countries like Chile in, in Latin America, I'm not sure about the US, but in Chile uh, there's a law that carriers have to track you all the time. All the time they need to know where you are and record it. So, and in fact, you can send a letter to them and say, I want to know everything you have on me. And they will send you all the places you've been in your life since you've been with that carrier. It's amazing and scary at the same time. But this doesn't have GSM. This doesn't have, sorry. This doesn't have GPS. This has Wi-Fi. How does Wi-Fi location works? It's idiotically easy. It's like this. There's, how many of you have Android? May you please raise your hands if you use Android. A Windows Phone. No Windows Phone, that's... Blackberry. Nice. Blackberry, any Blackberry? Yeah. iPhone. All right, any other phone that I didn't mention? Which one? It's over a trio. A trio? Oh, oh, oh trio i5. I love following that time. <laughs> what about you? I've got an old Razer. 
A racer? Yeah. The, 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 the racer? Yeah. The DJ camera? Yeah. Wow. I love. Did, did, did you know that that was the coolest phone in the market before the iPhone? The racer, the Motorola racer. Okay, cool. So you all have. A lot of you have Android phones. A lot of you have iPhones. When you use Android for the first time, Android has this little box that says, "Hey, you want to anonymously, anonymously, anonymously use a Google Hello Location services to improve your location?" Oh yes, please. What it does, what it really does, <laughs> is that when you are walking, sometimes randomly it starts the GPS, and it says you're here and here. Then it starts the Wi-Fi uh, network, and it doesn't matter if your Wi-Fi has WPA2 or anything at all. It doesn't matter, because that's not what it cares. It cares about something called a MAC address. A MAC address is an address that is born on the ship of anything that can be on a network. Uh, they are unique, they can't be changed, unless you use something like tomato and things like that. But mostly they can't be changed, and normal people don't change it. If you know what Neugris means, you're not normal people. <laughs> but normal people can change them. Can't, sorry, can't change them. And normally, you don't move a router. Normally, you buy a router and you forget about that thing as fast as you can. As long as it gives you the interwebs, right? So, uh, normally, <laughs> normally. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do use tomato, I do I do body of service all the time in my house, my girl from Paisley. Uh, <laughs> so what it does is I get all the Wi-Fi antennas around, I get the MAC addresses and I geolocate them and I send them to Google, Google Geolocation Services it's called. So I know that the noise bridge and the noise bridge dash A routers are in this location. And then the next time I need my location and I don't have GPS and I don't have 3G like this, I do a sweep of all the Wi Fi antennas that are around and I say to Google, hey, these are the MAC addresses of, of where I am. And Google says, well, you are around approximately this latitude and this longitude with a 100 meter precision, which is the range of Wi Fi. And that's how key location works in HTML5. So they can track you through Wi Fi. Ah, at the first, at first, uh, at first, uh, the, the way it used to be before Android, uh, just the way it used to be before Android, uh, they did they did this with the Google Street View cards. Have you seen them? Now, now, now they don't need a pilot. They can put a dog there because they have the self-driving car. <laughs> but but with that card, that card didn't only take pictures. That car also did Wi-Fi allocation. That was the first thing. And in Europe, they sued the hell out of Google because of that. Uh, or Good question. So is that so is that why now they can do uh, offline maps now for Google? Did they just announce that? Well, offline maps were a little bit different. Offline maps are just they're doing they're using something called the HTML5 caching API so that they can download a lot of data to your hard drive and then access it as if you were online. Uh, they're doing a lot of a combination of a lot of things. They're not downloading uh, all the Wi-Fi location data of your area, but they're downloading the maps. And sometimes they have it. Uh, Google, by the way, I say a lot about Google, but Google, Google is just the most famous company that does it because Google is all colors and shiny. But everybody does it. Everybody. Micro if you use a Windows phone, they also have a. a it's called Bing location services to Bing. If you use an iPhone. Uh, I, Apple, when 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 Apple used to love, Apple used to love Google, no, they don't because because. But when 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 they love Google, they use Google Geolocation Services. Now they have their own maps, which suck, by the way. I don't know if you have used eight, iOS six. You can't find anything. You can't. You're you're you are, you are less of a human being when you use iOS six. At least I am. I don't know anything about about north and south, and I depend on my phone to go to my home. <laughs> and in iOS, and iOS 6, which is what he has when he was the only guy in our party who had data, uh, we, we couldn't find our way. We, we need to do this uncivilized thing that is called asking for directions. Uh, but Apple uses Skyhook. Skyhook is another company. Actually, in the Android world, Motorola used to, used to use Skyhook as their allocation service. And then Google got mad and said, "No, nah, you can't use Google. You can't use Skype. You need to use us." And Motorola said, "Okay." And Skype sued. And then Google buy Motorola, and that died. Yeah. 
Uh, there's a lot of drama going on behind. So this is co-location. Does anybody have any other question about co-location? What about Blackberry? Blackberry. Blackberry started, I, I, I forgot about Blackberry, sorry. Blackberry started with GSM in the Blackberry Gold. In the Blackberry Torch, they have co-location and I think it's a Skyhook, I'm not sure. The, the results are quite similar to what Skyhook gives you. There's a simple experiment to know what company uses what, and it's uh, try to do a little application, uh, getting the, the latitude and longitude. As I said, it's just one line of code. It's as is that easy. Navigation dot location dot get current position. That's it. I swear to you. Well, you need to do a, a, a feedback function to get the latitude and longitude, but that's just that's that's easy. Uh, do, do that experiment and try in several browsers. Safari is Apple, so they use Skype. Chrome is a uh, Chrome is Google Location Service, so they use the themselves. Uh, Firefox, I'm not sure. I think Firefox also uses Google Location Services because Google finances a lot of the Firefox operation. Uh, Opera uses Skyhook as well. And blah blah blah. All right, next. Touch events. Touch. Oh, sorry. Just before you move on, quick question. We'll probably sure. help everybody else. I hope to. So, what would the output be if I'm tunneling this to, to, to say that I'm in Cartagena? And I'm using tomorrow, and my and I'm masking my MAC address. What's the output going to be in that system? Excellent question. I love that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> if you do a lot of weird stuff to confuse the, the poor poor system, uh, you can have two things. You can have a wrong latitude and longitude, or you can have an error. A uh, Google location. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, HTML5 geolocation has a second function in case it fails. You do navigation dot location dot get current position, and that's a function, and it requires two parameters. The first parameter is the function that triggers when everything goes okay. The second parameter is the function that triggers when everything goes to hell. Uh, there's two ways to go to hell. The first way is: Did you see that that uh, you as a user need to give the website permission? Did you see it? I'm not sure if you catch it. Uh, the message is quite different depending on the browser you use, and if you say no. Then you trigger the error function, and then you can say to them, okay, that's fine, or sooner or later I'll catch you some, some relaxing message. Um, I had an experiment, as, I, as, as Christian said, we do these courses in a lot of countries. I did, I did the course one weekend in Chile, probably, and then we flew to Mexico. And when we did it in Mexico, uh, my demo thought it was in Chile. And I was going crazy. How the hell did this happen? Why is geolocating me in Chile? So we did a lot of experiments, and what happened is that normally uh, we use two laptops to do our keynotes, and one of our laptops uh, blocks to the Ethernet of the auditorium, and, com and it converts in a quick Wi-Fi hotspot. And some Android device captured that laptop, thought it was a router, and geolocated in Chile. So I have a laptop that anywhere in the world thinks it's in Chile. <laughs> because of that. So that's what we're talking about. But that's the thing, for example, I remember there was this project of people switching routers all over the United States, like people from San Francisco. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's screw it like It's like, yeah, let's let's try to bother the, the geolocation systems. But now with the phones, they are doing they are doing the database more often. So it's kind of hard, you know? But still, it's I recommend people if you can try to confuse routers to, to do it. And see how they improve. Google actually was the first one to try something quite cool. Uh, they, at first, for example, you could really, really, really confuse Skyhook. Skyhook didn't know what to do. Skyhook, if you have, if you have place with a router in San Francisco and a router in New York, it will, it will know. It will say, please don't do this to me. I'm gonna crash. Skyhook will put you somewhere else, Minnesota, Mississippi, somewhere else. Uh, Google instead did the normal thing to do, it normalized the data. It did a histogram, it, it said this is an error, this is an error, this is an error, this is a normal thing, so we'll geolocalize geo you right. And a normal antenna captures a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots. So this is not just noise bridge, noise bridge normal and noise bridge dash A, it's a lot of Wi-Fi's in a lot of places. And in that way, it's really hard to confuse Google with the location services right now. They are quite, quite reliable. And actually, that's the way the iPod Touch geolocation worked when it launched. And that's the way the first iPhone geolocation worked. They didn't have GPS, they were using uh, uh, Wi-Fi. Touch 
events. Touch events are quite important because touch events in mobile are faster than clicks. I, didn't, I don't know if you knew that. Uh, when you do touch event, you, I probably, if you have programmed anything, you know that the event for click is called click. And that's it. It depends on the language, but it's called click. That's easy. But there's also a lot of events. This is a mouse down, this is a mouse up, right? But what happens in the way in, in the world of the touch? When you do this, you do a tap or a touchdown. And this is a touch up. Well, it's not exactly like that. It depends on the, on the, on the framework. You can use jQuery Mobile, you can use naked JavaScript if you are that good, blah, blah, blah. What you need to know is this. If you do touch events instead of click, they will be immediate. They are immediate. In the, in, in, a, in the exact moment that you do this, the event will trigger. So it will result in a faster answer. If you do it with click, if you use the same code that you normally use in desktops, in mobile browsers, it has a 300 millisecond delay. Because they are waiting to see if you do this. Instead, if you use the tab, it's immediate. All right? And there's also support for multi-touch. With JavaScript, you can know if you have one, two, three, four, five, or ten fingers. I think ten is late, depending on the, on, the, on the hardware. Also, accelerometers. With JavaScript, you can know how much, uh, in, in which way do I, uh, do I have the phone. If I have it like this, if I have it like this, or even if I have it like this, they give you precise data. Next is web workers, and we're stuck. Web workers is uh, a little, uh, it's something new for JavaScript. It's a way to do multi-threading computing with JavaScript. With web work, uh, in JavaScript, when you use JavaScript, JavaScript only uses one thread. To me, that's kind of crazy. The browsers will never use the multi-core capabilities of a multi-core processor, depending obviously on the browser. If you're using Chrome V8, it will use everything. That's why Chrome is so fast. But for example, if you're using Internet Explorer 9, you will only use one core. Um, and that doesn't make sense in our world. In our world, we have phones with four cores. Um, so, Web Workers is a way to say to the browser, hey, do this in another thread. Do this in parallel, so you can do parallel computing. It's incredibly cool. Uh, and, and it's incredibly important in a lot of, in a lot of places. For example, if you're, doing, if you're doing anything in real time, and, and, you are, and you have some JavaScript code constantly shaking, for example, if you have new tweets to, to put it on the screen, that will block everything else, and it will make it slower. Because the way serial, serial computing emulates parallel is that they do little queues. You go first, you go last, you go next, you go next. Instead, if you use web workers, everything happens at the same time, and you can speed incredibly well. That's what made Gmail work so fast, suddenly. How many of you use Gmail? All right, Gmail is quite cool. It has the best user experience uh, in webmail-based uh, mail. Sorry. Uh, in my opinion, obviously. I, I, I haven't seen a better user experience web-based. And I travel a lot, so I really need that. Gmail used to be as low as hell. Gmail used to be really slow. Do you remember that? That you opened Gmail and then you went to somewhere else to get a cup of coffee and then you came back and it was still loading? It was really slow, incredibly slow. Because Gmail advanced, really advanced the state of the web. And the price for that is that it slowed the hell of the browser. Uh, eventually, a lot of browsers began to support web workers and Gmail implemented that. And that's why Gmail is way faster in this time. Oh, time. Sorry, I have a lot of problems with that. Now, engines. There's something inside the browsers called engines. There's a lot of engines, render engines, JavaScript engines. Right now here, I want to talk about JavaScript engines. JavaScript engines are the things that take the code and convert it to bytecode, that convert it to things that the, set, that the CPU understands that makes code work. Uh, the better engines right now to, for JavaScript are V8 for Google Chrome, Nitro and Safari, Jagger Monkey. Actually, there's a better one than, than Jagger Monkey right now for Firefox. And um, there's there's a lot of uh, engines as well for Internet Explorer and our browsers. Engines are important because they change the way JavaScript works. JavaScript is something called a script language. It's something that you write that you never compile to machine code. That is just text, and that it gets interpre interpreted right yeah. uh, in real time using the CPU. Uh, that's really slow. 
So Adobe, yes, Adobe, surprise, oh my god, Adobe, Macromedia actually. Macromedia and Adobe released as open source a little bit of the Flash Player code, the Flash Player code. The Flash Player code had something called Tamarin. Tamarin was a project from, a, from Adobe that in between getting JavaScript to run on the CPU, converted it to bytecode. It's called a just-in-time computer. It gets the, in, 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 in the moment that you need the code, it compiles to a bytecode that the CPU can understand more easily and it will run faster. So they, they open source that and Firefox took it and became the, the Tamarin project and, and eventually become Jagger Monkey. A lot of browsers have been doing that and now we have V8, Nitro, etc. That's why JavaScript is way faster right now. You can do JavaScript code that runs as fast as a native application, native, sorry, in desktops. And they're getting there. They're getting there in browsers. The Safari, the Safari, the Safari Nitro JavaScript is really fast, but it's not as fast as it should be. Especially because, in my opinion, I think Apple, Apple hates the web. I don't know if you have noticed, but Apple is incredibly good in hardware and software, but they have sucked in every effort that they have made to go to the web. Uh, the, the, the iCloud right now is nice, but mobile me? That, that, that blew incredibly bad. <laughs> but incredibly bad. Uh, Apple, Apple doesn't understand the web. Apple actually hates the web. That's why the App Store exists. A lot of things that you have in the App Store of, of, of the iPhone or the iPad should be able to exist in HTML5. And actually they do. So why don't we have that? Uh, in the Android world, it used to be that JavaScript sucked. But Google I.O. happened. And in Google I.O. they released Chrome, and they released the final version of Chrome. I've been testing it in Jelly Bean. It works really cool. It works really, really, really fast. It feels almost like a desktop experience. So I think JavaScript is almost there to get a performance as a native application. And then we have PhoneGap and Adobe Air, again, Adobe. Adobe is quite surprising. A lot of people hate them, but they are doing a lot of good things. Uh, PhoneGap uh, is an open source project right now in the hands of the Apache Foundation. Apache? 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 Apache. In the Apache Foundation, we call it Apache, sorry. In the Apache Foundation, uh, it's called the Project Cordova. Project Cordova used to be PhoneGap. It's a way to get HTML5 and put in HTML5 all the things that native applications can do and then wrap it in a little package and send it to Apple and send it to the Google Play Store so you can sell them in the App Store. The best example I know, the best example I know of a good use of PhoneGap is the Wikipedia application. Wikipedia had a real problem. You know Wikipedia, you know the project, and you know they are all about never having ads, never having advertising because they are about free content for the people. And they were, they didn't have an, a, a mobile application. They were never, they, 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 they never considered having an, uh, having an app. And what they saw was that a lot of people wanted to do that because people, because of marketing, when they have an iPhone, they don't go to the browser, they go to the app store, and they say Wikipedia. They install the first thing that they can see, and that's the way they use the Wikipedia. And what they were seeing is that a lot of people said, "Hey, Wikipedia plus ads, profit." So they put, they put a, a lot of people, a lot of people created Wikipedia apps with AdSense. It's kind of ironic, and they run in Apple, so. Uh, with an, and other kinds of ads. And, and people were downloading them, people were using Wikipedia, and people were seeing ads, but they didn't care because people. Uh, Wikipedia saw that as a problem, so they decided to create the best app they could do, but they didn't want to maintain a lot of base codes. They didn't want to do an iPad app, an iPhone app, an Android app. So they decided to do it in HTML5 and PhoneGap. And PhoneGap gives HTML5 the capabilities to, for example, access the camera, access the file system, uh, and other things. But mostly that, camera, file system, notifications. When they did that, uh, they became one of the most downloaded apps in the App Store and in the Google Play Store. That was quite cool. And they did it with the PhoneGap because they could have just one, one base, one code base. Is it code base or base code? Sorry. Code base? Say code base. Base code? Got that. No, one code base. No, yeah, one code base. A base of code. Yes, we, we, we just one code. Yeah? All right? Cool. Code base, base code? Code base. Code base. I would say code base from now on. With just one code base, they can maintain iPhone, iPad, and Android applications. So it's cool. Woo! This is a long presentation. WebSockets! 
Web sockets is incredible. Web sockets, it, let's see, I, I know this is noise free. Normally a lot of people would raise their hands, but here probably not. Who of you use Facebook? Sorry? Facebook, who uses it? I do. So, like, 60% of you. All right, in Facebook, sometimes you are in Facebook probably seeing pictures of your family, shaking how's your ex, things like that. Normal Facebook thing, right? And boom, you see a notification, like Messenger. Do you remember Messenger? Nobody does. All right, so you see a notification in the corner, and they say, your mother has comment on your picture, and you say, ah! That's something that, that, that happens sometimes, and it's real time. In, at the same time that your mother puts a comment on your picture, you freak out in real time. That's the magic of WebSockets. Uh, HTTP, a Hypertext Transfer Protocol, it's an stateless protocol. It's a protocol that doesn't care about you, to, be, to, be, to summarize. Uh, let's, let's talk about that state protocol, a, a protocol with state. FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Have you used it? I, I think most of you have. All right, FTP has a state. What it means is that it remembers who you are and where you are. When you open FTP, you say, hey, I'm Freddy, and here's my password. And FTP says, okay, welcome, here's your files. And, and, it all, and the connection stays online. And when you wanna go to another folder, then FTP says, oh, you changed folder, here, here are the files. Have them, or give me more. And when you go away, they say goodbye, and they close the connection, right? HTTP is not like that. When you go to HTTP, you say, hey, I want files, hey, have them. And it doesn't even say goodbye. <laughs> no, it actually does. It actually does in the protocol. But the thing is, they close the connection immediately. Immediately. They close the connection. They never maintain it. That's why you can't have sessions. That's why the login thing, logout thing, it's, it's a fake. The way, it's, the way it works in HTTP is that you have a cookie with a unique ID in your, in your hard drive. That cookie is what a session is. That cookie, that cookie always stays in the HTTP protocol and it knows who you are because that cookie is related to the entry in the database that is you on the website. Uh, WebSockets is a way to fix that in a way. WebSockets is a connection that carries through HTTP and it works like this. When you, you're a browser and you say, hey website, give me something. Hey, here it is. Did you have it? Hey, did you receive that? And the browser never says a thing. If the browser doesn't acknowledge that you receive it, the connection, up, the connection stays open. Sometimes the browser, sometimes the server. But if you don't acknowledge that everything is done, the connection stays open. So you can have a socket. And in real time, if something happens in the server, you can send it to the browser. If something's happening in the browser, you can send it to the server, and the server can send it to all the sockets connected. WebSockets, in short, is a way to do chats. It's a way to do uh, games. It's a way to do real time stuff. And it's really used. Uh, if you use Gmail, Gmail used to work with Ajax. It, it, it had a millisecond ping. So, for example, when, when it's been three seconds or one minute, it will ping the Gmail server and it will get all the new emails and it will send them and it will show them to you. But right now, in Gmail, if you have a new email, you will know immediately because they're using a socket to know that. Facebook, Facebook chat works like that. Twitter with the new mentions works like that, etc. And the coolest WebSocket server right now is called Node.js. Node.js is a server that uses JavaScript server side. So you, you don't need to use Python and Django, you don't need to use Ruby and Rails, and you don't especially need to use PHP. You only need to use JavaScript. You can do the same, the very same JavaScript that you have in the client that you use in HTML5 to connect to databases in the backend. Uh, that's Node.js. But WebSockets is quite advanced. So what happens with other browsers? What happens if I have an aunt that still is in Windows XP with Internet Explorer 6? How can she enjoy the joys of the future? So there's this project of this very cool hacker, hacker called Socket.io. Socket.io is a project that wraps the, the WebSocket protocol and it enables them to use it in all browsers, even Internet Explorer 5.5. It's incredible. The way it works, if you're interested in that, is that they have a flash player, a one pixel by one pixel Swift file that has actual script code in it, and, and it only works when you don't have WebSockets. So if you're in a really old browser, a, a, flash play, a little flash player, invisible flash player activates, and actual script has WebSockets since flash file. 
so, so they can use it. And at the end of this connectivity side, we have JSON. JSON is the new way to transport the information between applications. JSON is basically, uh, I, I hate XML. XML has a lot of verbosity, has a lot of unnecessary code, a lot of unnecessary text that you don't need. XML is HTML for information. Uh, JSON is way, way more optimized. JSON is basically, you organize a file like you organize variables. In, in JavaScript, and you send it to another language, and the other language understands it immediately because it's simply code. It's variables in a block of code. That's all that JSON is JavaScript object notation. JSON. The last point of my presentation is CSS3. The reason I ask if, you, if any of you were interested in design is because CSS3 revolutionized in a radical way the way we design for the web. Design is really important. Design is the way normal people interact with the web. And, and I, I, as I said at, the, at, uh, at first, and I mean it as a compliment, we are not normal people here. We know what it means. We probably know how to create a laser without an end case. And that's quite cool. I saw it, I saw it last week here. It's a, it's a really weird laser that I, don't, I, ha, I have no clue how it works. But, but it has like a ray cannon and it shoots light in a straight way. I don't know. But it's really cool. So, CSS3 is really important because if you don't have the right interface, nobody will care about what you build. You really need to build the right interface, a human interface, and you do that with design. Design is the way technology communicates with people. And for that, I need to talk about the XHTML and Ajax revolution. Ah, by the way, good morning. Yeah, <laughs> more like. HTML, XHTML and Ajax revolution. Normal people call that the Web 2.0. I hate the Web 2.0 term with passion. Uh, so, this is XHTML. XHTML was a way to organize the thing that was HTML, which HTML was ugly, 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 and not ugly language. A lot of people did markups in uppercase or lowercase. They opened the tags, they didn't put the tags, whatever. This is XHTML. It's three rules, three simple rules. If you have an attribute, uh, uh, the, the value of an attribute, you need to put it in quotes. Easy as that. If you open a tag, you better close it, or it won't render. And if the tag doesn't have anything inside, you close it like this. And everything is in lowercase. That's it. You know XHTML. That was an express course on XHTML. But XHTML was not a revolution. It was the push for something that changed the web forever. The web used to be a way to share information and it became an application, a way to do things, a way to create things. And that thing was Ajax, a synchronous JavaScript and XML. Ajax is a little piece of technology uh, that enables you to connect to the web server to get data or to send data and to get them back without refreshing, refreshing the browser. You need to refresh it. Do you know what? Uh, what was the first popular application to use Ajax? Does anybody know? No? Yes, but that has a more basic name. No? It's easy. It was Gmail. Gmail changed the web, in my humble opinion. Gmail was launched on Fool's Day, April Fool's. You remember? Nobody, nobody could leave it. Nobody said, oh yeah, Google is going to have it. No, no, yeah. One gigawatt. <laughs> and it's because, it's because we live in pain. We used to live in pain. Do you remember how webmail were in that time? Webmail was like this. Webmail was 5 megabytes at hotmail.com. Yeah? 5 megabytes. What do you do with 5 megabytes in this time? You take a picture and you're done. That's it. You send it and you can't do anything else. And right now, you, how, how much space do you have in Gmail right now? Sometime in the past, they say, screw it. Uh, the, the, the hard drive technology is advancing faster than we can update the counter. So we're going to apply an algorithm. And the counter is always, is always increasing. I think it's 8 gigabytes right now of space. Something oh, like that. I don't care. I've got 10. 10, he gets, he, he, he got 10. All right, <laughs> you're lucky today. Uh, uh, Gmail changed the web. And it didn't change it because it has a lot of space. It freaked them out because it had a lot of space. I, I don't know who it was if you were working in Hotmail, but imagine it. You, you have a service that gives you five megabytes, and Google says, hey, one gigabyte. Ah! I, I, 
I, I don't know how, how you react to that. Yahoo was the coolest one in town, and Yahoo had only 150 megabytes. And they had one gigabyte, and they changed the way it was. But that's not what it, what's important. What's important is that it has the best, coolest interface ever. Gmail has an incredible interface, incredible interface, because they use Ajax. They, it was the first application, commercial-wise, that didn't refresh. They auto-update. When you click Inbox, you went to the Inbox. When you were in Hotmail and you click Inbox, you will see an interstitial about how you need to buy something for your mod. Then you will click Close and you will see a lot of spam. Then you will click and you will wait. And then you will open an email. That's the way it used to be because it refreshed. In Gmail, you only click and it happened. That's it. That, that was thanks to Ajax. Do you know who invented Ajax? No? Ajax, ah, by the way, I need to apologize first. I, I will go to your question, I promise. I need to apologize first. The, the next images are, are not uh, for the faint of heart. So if, if, if you're sensitive, you can see to the ceiling. It's a very beautiful ceiling, it's not. Uh, but it's a pretty cool city. All right? <coughs> the guys who invented Ajax were there. <laughs> Internet Explorer. In 1996, I believe, in Internet Explorer 5, they included something called XML HTTP request. And nobody cared. But they put it anyway. It's a way to go to the server, get data back to the browser, and never refresh. Nobody cared until 2004, when Gmail decided to get that thing out of the grave because it was code that it was that code was sleeping in the Gecko-based browsers, Mozilla, and in the Trident-based browsers, Internet Explorer, and they used it and they created Gmail. You had a question. So what's the relationship between this and the sockets I've used? I thought was enough. Also something that oh, this is the past. I'm sorry, I jumped to the past. The web sockets is the future, Jay. Well, actually, it's the present. It's, it's not that complicated. So does WebSockets replace it? Not exactly. I hope they replace it, but no, no, not a lot of people are using them. The reason for that is that they are hard to program. Sorry. They're really, really hard to program. But the results are similar, that you, you can get data updated on your screen without... without Actually, WebSockets, WebSockets are way better. WebSockets, with WebSockets, you get real-time data when it happens. With Ajax, what you do is you do pings. That's the way the BlackBerry push server work. You, hey, do you have something here? No. You have something here? No. You have something here? No. You have something here? I said no. You have something here? Okay, come. That, that's, that's the way Ajax works. You, you do things, and when something new arrives, you get it. That's the only way. With WebSockets, you wait. You push and pull. And you, and you push and pull, exactly. But, but this changed everything in 2004. And that way, you get really advanced applications. Yeah? So this thing existed for like eight years. And nobody used it. didn't know how to use it or weren't using it. They, uh, it, it wasn't popular. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been in the browsers for a lot of, let, let me give you an example. Did you know that you can program in Visual Basic for the web? You, you don't need to use JavaScript. There's something called Visual Basic Script. It's basically a C. Uh, only Internet Explorer. Yeah, Internet Explorer has this thing called Visual Basic Script. In the browser wars of the 90s, uh, Mozilla, or actually Netscape, and Internet Explorer fought a lot. For example, uh, there was a browser that had a marquee tag, and another browser that had a blink tag. So the marquee tag could do marquees, and the blink did this, and they fight because of that. It's not like that, but that's the summarized version. And a lot of code, a lot of weird code, found their way to the render engines. That's something that I'm about to talk. And they stay there. There's a lot of things. Some some things are not that good. Some things are quite cool. Uh, but uh, but they stay there and nobody use them or nobody care. In the case of XML HTTP request, it was weird and nobody knew the API. Actually, what Google did, as far as I remember, it wasn't the technical block that they did a long time ago. So sorry if I'm jumping around uh, specifications. What I think I remember is that they basically had to reverse engineer the way XML HTTP requests work because nobody really understood. And it's quite easy. It's just a normal request, but you don't send HTML, you send information, and then you manipulate that information with JavaScript. Uh, that's, that's, that's why XML HTTP request, the real name for Ajax, uh, was hidden for such a long time. It's not that it was hidden, it's just that nobody cared. 
For example, SVG, Scalar Vector Graphics, it's been there for a long time in a lot of browsers and nobody cares. It's that much that nobody cares that the original Android browser didn't ship with the SVG code because it made it smaller. And, 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 and the Google guys said, well, actually you are the Google guys, right? <laughs> but the Android guys said, uh, we, we don't need this. So we can ship a smaller code because nobody's using SVG in the, in the internet. So we can get rid of this code. But they realized that SVG suddenly become popular, Adobe is pushing it, and they put it back in Android Ice Cream Sandwich and in Google Chrome for Android. So a lot of this stuff happens. The web is weird, but that's, that's why it's a cool. So, Internet Explorer, this bluey with the yellow tomorrow around is probably the main source of pain for people who want to create for the web. Because you create something cool, it looks really awesome, and then you put it on the E and it doesn't work. Or it works like shit. Uh, it's a, sorry. It's, it's, a, it's a real problem. It's a really, really, really big problem. Just don't put it on the E. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. And, it, and it's actually becoming a trend. This month, this current month, I don't know if you know that, this month, Chrome became the first browser in the world. The most used browser. Internet Explorer at last is the second. When I started in this business in 2004, uh, my statistics look like 94% Internet Explorer and 5% Firefox. It was just starting, it was called Firebird in that time, and the rest was Opera, and I hated my life. Right now, Internet Explorer is in the US less than 50%, and that's awesome, that's awesome, that's incredible. That's a privilege that we're living in that kind of age. You really don't remember <laughs> the pain that it used to be to be a web developer. But with Internet Explorer is still a really hateful browser, and if you want to do something for the general population, you need to do your thing to Internet Explorer. Uh, hopefully, uh, thankfully, sorry, thankfully, uh, Internet Explorer 9 actually works, and it's actually kind of cool. And Internet Explorer 10 is also kind of cool. It has HTML5 support, it has CSS3, it has geolocation, it has a lot of stuff. I don't know what happened, probably they, they they are really scared and they are becoming relevant. That's something that's happening at Microsoft. They're never gonna die. Microsoft is way too big for that. But the main source of, uh, I don't remember how you use, uh, there's a synonymous for scary. Fear. fear, the main source of fear, thank you, random user, thanks. Uh, the main source of fear on Microsoft right now is that they, became, they can become relevant and that nobody will care about Windows Phone, nobody will care about Microsoft Surface, nobody will care about other things. It's not that they will fail, they won't fail. Windows is really, 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 really too big to fail right now. Oh, that phrase is not that good in this country, right? Uh, they're, 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 they're way too big. They, they won't fail, I'm sure of that. They, will, they won't go bankrupt, but they will become relevant in the technology world, and that, that's, that's something that they fear. So, this is a source of pain, but I want to tell you to believe in me, or not believe in me, believe in you, who most probably, I hope, believe in me. <laughs> there are these special people in the world. They are called hackers. And they have been doing amazing things. So that Internet Explorer won't be a pain for us. And I will show them. I will show them to you. So, now we know everybody's using HTML5. HTML5 is the hottest thing in the web developing market. And you may say, really? No, that's not true. That's impossible. How, how, how's that that, 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 that everybody's using HTML5? Well, let me give you some examples. YouTube is using HTML5, I told you that. YouTube right now, if you use it on a, bra on a, on a, on a Boai browser, you don't see a Flash player, you see HTML5, the video tag. And in fact, sometimes, I'm sure, you have been using the HTML5 YouTube in your desktop browser, and you don't even know, and you don't even knew that because they are doing a random A-B testing of their HTML5 player. If you want to be on the beta testing voluntarily, I am, you go to youtube.com slash, <coughs> sorry, slash HTML5. youtube.com slash HTML5. You click join the beta, and you will never ever use Flash Player again to see YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's actually incredibly fast, because you know, you know what's the advantage of using the video tag? In computers, the video will always be rendered by the GPU. So it's way faster and it doesn't hit the CPU and oh crap, sorry. Pretend you didn't see it. And it doesn't hit the CPU and it uses less power. 
uh, youtube.com slash html5. Twitter obviously has been using html5 for a long time. For example, did you know that your tweets are geolocated? A lot of people don't notice that. When you first use m.twitter.com, they tell you, hey, you want to accept that, and people, have you, have you, have you seen people that read the user agreements or things like that? They just click accept, and they ignore the rest. Uh, there's this scary project, I don't remember the URL, but I encourage you to Google it and teach it to me, because I, I, I saw that project and I thought it was really cool. There was this project that took a lot of Twitter timelines and mapped them. So you could put your, your Twitter account, for example, Freddy R, and it will tell you all the places you've been according to your tweets. Because a lot of people don't care and they click share, they click accept, they don't even read. So they don't know that the computer is activating the HTML5 geolocation API. And it's in the API and it's public, it's public data. The, 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 the government authorities don't even have to try anymore. <laughs> yeah. You can run do not track software though through Twitter. Oh, that's right. Or if I said run Twitter through do not, do not, track, do not track software. Yeah, but there, there's a lot of browsers that still don't support it and as I said before, it, the problem is not us. We are fine, and we will most probably be always fine. The problem is we know a lot of people that don't care or don't need to care about technology that we need to explain to them what's important, why it's important. They, they don't even know what geolocation may mean. They have sheeple. a lot of means for that. Huh? We call them sheeple. <laughs> well, sheeple. Uh, there, there's a lot of people, and, it's, and it's, it's not an obligation, but it's a good thing that we can do to notch the, the right way. Anyway, going on. And oh, they also do a lot of HTML5 fancy stuff, yeah, rounded borders, things like that. Gmail, as I said, Gmail did Ajax, but Gmail did something else. Gmail did drag and drop. Drag and drop files. Have you used this? If you haven't, you can try it. You just drag a file from your desktop into your browser, and we will auto-attach to an email. It's incredible, it's, it's really, really, really cool, really, really great. And that's something that Google Wave gave us. When Google Wave died, it gave us drag and drop. <laughs> really, I, I, I used to love Google Wave, really, really. I thought it was the future. I was, I was, I was so wrong and young. Facebook! Uh, when I did this presentation, I, I, I got a hold of the beta of this project. It, was, it used to be called Project Spartan. It was super secret, and I thought it was, I was really cool, and now it's really, so I'm not cool anymore. But this is the Facebook HTML5 application. Uh, and if you see something here, this looks exactly the same in an iPad or in a phone. They did something that was, it, it was not created, it was discovered two years ago. It's called Responsive Design. The way to do websites with one base code, code base, code, sorry, with one code base and distribute it in any kind of screen. I will also adjust and immediately give you the best experience possible. That's 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 responsive design. And Facebook did it with the, with their HTML5 app. In fact, the native app of Facebook was cheating. It was not native at all. It was phone app and HTML5 but they decided not to do it. Right now, Facebook rewrite, it, rewrite all the native applications on iOS to Objective-C. They did that because, as I said, Apple hates the web. I mean it. Apple, the web view component for native applications doesn't have a, the, the, the JavaScript engine for acceleration. They are really slow. If you use Safari, it's really fast. Safari Web. But if you use the web view of Safari inside an application, it's artificially slow because Apple hates the web. I don't think there's any other explanation. They don't need to do that at all. Android doesn't. But anyway, uh, this is an example of something quite cool. If you like music, this is a piano made 100% in HTML5 and JavaScript using the HTML5 audio API. Right now, Google has incredible experiments in Chrome. Google is really pushing the audio tag. Google has a, a capability in the audio tag to create sound through code without samples at all. You can create sound like you will do it with Python, with C, with C++, just with JavaScript. It's really cool. And of course, there's this application that is everywhere. There's one single application. It's actually a game. And it's a game you see everywhere, everywhere. The game runs on everything. You probably know which one. Angry Birds. 
Angry Birds, I when when I when I when I saw Angry Birds, I thought it was a game. Right now, I think it's the next Disney, or I'm not sure. It's everywhere. I see I see I see little children with Angry Birds hats on the street, and it's it's, it's an iPhone game. I want to tell them that. What are you doing? It's a game, and it runs on everything, on everything, everything. You probably will take a spoon and it will run Angry Birds. It really runs on everything. There's this HTML5 version of Angry Birds. It was released last year on Google I.O. And it's chrome.angrybirds.com. Please don't enter that URL right now. Uh, and it's 100% HTML5. 100% HTML5 and JavaScript. So, probably you already know this. HTML5 is not, is not just HTML5. It's HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. HTML5 is not only the tag, uh, the, the tag standard, the standard of the new uh, hypertext tag, it's also an umbrella term for the new generation of technologies to create the web. And this is the coolest one to do interfaces. CSS3 styling, cascade style sheets. This is the way to do design. I repeat this a lot because there's a lot of people that have this misconception. You never do design in HTML. That's why doing design with tables is wrong. It's not because the hipster guys are not using tables. No, it's because tables are for tabulated data. They are not for anything else. So when you use tables for design, what you are doing is creating design in HTML. And HTML is for content, for semantic content. Everything can, can you can make everything with CSS3. Everything can be made, everything, design-wise. Let me show you some examples of what CSS3 changed. The first one, I put it first because it has been available since Internet Explorer 6 and nobody uses it. Font face. Font face is a way to use any font at all. At all. Any font. Any font. As long as you have a license for that font, you can use that font, that typography, any font at all in your website. Any, any. You have the Helvetica. LOL. The 34. You can you can use it. You, you you have the comic sons something like that. You can you can use anything at all as long as you have a license using phone face. And the cool thing about phone face is that it works since Internet Explorer 6. So it works everywhere, everywhere. Let me let me ask ask you something. Of all of you here who has more than 100 phones in your system, more than 100. Okay, you three more than 300. More than 500. How many funds do you have? A lot. A lot. <laughs> but you only use Helvetica at the end of the day, right? <laughs> yeah. Of course. So, uh, for designers, this is really important because the web has been boring as hell in the typography world. For a long time, you only use Geneva, Times New Roman, Arial. If, if you are really a bad person, you would use COVID sounds. But, but right now, you can use anything, anything. Any, any phone at all. In fact, this is creating something really cool. I, I think you heard about the retina display. That's the marketing term for the really high density resolutions of the iPad 3, the iPhone 4S, and the, uh, the iPhone 4, excuse me, and the new MacBook Pro with retina display. Uh, they are really incredibly hard to get a hold of. But I, I, managed, I managed to get a hold of. That's a MacBook Pro retina display recording this. So if you don't want to be there, please don't speak. Uh, and what I noticed is that the web sucks on Retina Display. The web looks like crap. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that you never really design for a Retina Display. The Retina Display is kind of a lie because it's a lot of pixels, but the Mac OS will never show them to the developer. To the developer, you will see 1024 per 768. That will be it. So the developer will never know that you need to put a double resolution image to make it look right. So you see everything. Did you did you remember when you switched from standard definition television to HD television and standard definition sucked incredibly? That's what happened to Retina Display. And other people are adapting to that. What's happening in the font face world is that fonts are vectors. So they auto adapt. And people are using iconography fonts, iconography typographies that have a lot of icons. So they scale. So when you need to you need to put a a lock a load icon or a save icon, you don't need to do it with a PNG. You can do it with a font, and that's pretty cool because it will scale to any screen at all. That's 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 quite nice. 
Now, let's talk about selectors. There are new selectors in CSS. You see the code here in the bottom, if you haven't noticed before. All right, so selectors. How was, this, this is how the web used to be. If you're a developer, if you're a developer, and most of you are developers, and you need to do a table, and the first row needs to be gray, the second white, the third red, so uh, odds, gray, evens, white, right? How did you do it? Probably you do a cycle, right? And then you'll see the number of the row, and then you, you will you will divide it by two, and if it has a, how do you say that in English? Remainder. Remainder. Remainder? All right. Residuo in Spanish, in case you don't know. Remainder. You, if you have a remainder, uh, like one, you can use the mod, the percentage sign. And if you have a reminder, it was uh, off, right? And if you didn't, it was an even. So you could put code, right? A cycle. What did designers do? The only thing they could do was Control C, Control B, Control C, Control B, and that's it. But you could do code, and the code was quite boring. It was boring code, and I hate boring code. Right now, in CSS, the only thing you need to do is take the selector for the rows for the thing that repeats. In this case, dot table. This is a class, right? A N T H child of or N T H child even, and then you have CSS code. And that way, you can say for the odds, white background. For the for the events, gray background. It's really easy, and you can even do it with the first letter. You, uh, so you can do the fancy first letter weird font effect, and this is this is the wiki, uh, this is not the Wikipedia. It's an article, but that's what the Wikipedia does. There's a lot another kind of selector. You can see the micro format inside an anchor tag. So, for example, if it's external, you can put a word. Have you seen that in Wikipedia? If you have an external link, they put a little word icon uh, to say, "Hey, you're getting out of the Wikipedia." So they do that with a CSS selector external. Uh, columns. Columns used to be really hard. Actually, they used to be impossible. There was no way to do columns at all. At all. The only way to do columns was to do really hard code. You need to count the amount of words, divide them by the amount of columns that you wanted, and then manually put them in different columns and manually organize them. It was a pain in the ass. You didn't do that. Uh, actually, in Internet Explorer 6, there was a technique, a really obscure technique, where you would do a one pixel div and you would put it in the middle of a paragraph. And Internet Explorer would know what to do and then, BAH! Columns! <laughs> it, 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 it's because, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't a standard at all. Uh, now you have column dash count 3. That's it. Column dash count 3, column dash count 2, column dash count 1. And you can control how many space you have here. You can put a line, you can do a lot of things. Don't use it for layout, use it for text. If you use it for layout, you will be in pain. Don't use it for layout. Opacity. Opacity enables us to create really interesting designs. You can do divs with backgrounds and then have a 50% opacity, so you can show what's behind and you can combine all of these things to create really compelling user interfaces. And it's as easy as write opacity 0.5, 50%. Incredibly easy, incredibly easy. And it enables us to create a lot of weird designs. This is actually my website, crystal.com. A web design I don't know it. Transitions. This used to be the, I'm, I'm really sad that this website is offline right now. This used to be the website to sell the Nissan Leaf. A car that looks really ugly on the outside, I love it. And really cool on the inside. It's an electric car. I really love it, really. It doesn't matter what people think. Uh, Nissan Leaf uh, decided, they decided to create a 100% HTML5 website that looked like Flash. So they have an incredibly flashy video, try, try to look for it, Nissan Leaf uh, website. Uh, they had a really flashy video, they had animations, they had sound, and do you know what? Animations are way easier to do in HTML5 than Flash. I used to do a lot of Flash code. Actually, Flash paid for my college education. Uh, the, the, way, the way I studied software engineering was doing flash code on the side. I'm never doing the university workshops and things like that. Yeah, I was a bad student. But I, I used to love flash when I was young, and it was because I was young. And I can tell you that uh, CSS animations are way easier. The way you do it is you put the first stage in CSS code, you put, the last, you put the last stage in CSS code, and then in the first stage you put this little line, transition, 
and in transition you put the CSS attribute that you want to animate, the amount of seconds that you want the animation to last, and kind of animation. So you can do all and all the attributes, all the different attributes will animate. Any mathematical attribute can be animated, even colors. So you can do interpolations. The seconds, you can do milliseconds here, and the kind of animation. You can do elastic animation, linear, uh, is in, is out, is in, out, is really easy. And the key word is transition. I'm going to finish. Sorry. Okay. So uh, round borders. This is the mecca of web design. Round borders. You know why? Because it used to suck to do it. How did you do web, uh, web border, uh, rounded borders in the past? You did four dips. One dip for that corner, one dip for that corner, and you did four PNGs, four transparent PNGs. It sucked. It, it didn't make any sense. Why? Why are you making us do this? You, you, you change careers when you had to do a border around the border. And right now, it's border radius, radius. That's it. And you can do precise border radius for this corner, that corner, etc. It works exactly like margin. It's really easy. And you can do reflections, but I really hate reflections, so I won't interrupt you. But you can look at them. It's reflection, that's it. You can do uh, shadows. This is a design that we need for a conference that we made in Colombia. Uh, shadows are really easy, and shadows also used to suck because shadows change according to content. So it was really hard to do uh, responsive shadows. You need to cut a lot of PNGs. Right now, it's only box shadow, or you can also do text shadow. You put the color, and you can put uh, something called RGBA, that's a color with an alpha channel. And you say uh, uh, how much you move in the x, uh, x g. How is that? Axis. Axis. Thank you. Sorry. A, A, X axis. G A, A, Y. Sorry. Y. Y. Y axis and the illumination of the shadow. It's really easy. So you can say, oh yeah, this is cool. Let's do HTML5. But a lot of people normally, not you obviously, but a lot of people say no. No, 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 that's a lie because my boss uses Windows 95 and a mouse with a little ball. <laughs> so he won't see what I'm trying to say. And here's where I talk about engines. There's a lot of engines and they are changing quite fast. When you're a web developer, you think that browsers are your main concern, but that's not true. Your main concern are engines. There's a lot of browsers, but there's only four engines. WebKit. WebKit is the engine that powers Safari, powers Google Chrome, and basically powers the whole mobile web. If you do something right for WebKit, it will work on everything in the mobile world. There's Gecko. Gecko is the render engine for what? Firefox, thank you. Anonymous bystander. Oh, you again. Nice. Uh, Firefox. Gecko, is the, Gecko used to be the render engine for Netscape. Right now it's the render engine for Firefox. And I don't know if you have noticed, but render engines are the thing that take HTML and make it pretty colors. Okay. Uh, Presto. Presto is the render engine for Opera. And Trident, Trident is the evil one. So I won't mention it. Because if you mention it three times, you get sued. Uh, <laughs> what I need to say here in the render engines is that there's not a lot of them. There's just four. There's a lot of browsers, but there are just four render engines. And the four of them are moving forward. Internet Explorer 9 changed the version. That's why Internet Explorer 6 to 8 suck, because they all use 3 and 4. Internet Explorer 9 changed, and they're using 3 and 5. A total, a total uh, refactoring of the code. Uh, and, and they have a of export. There's these websites that's, that gives you uh, real-time information about uh, how much those browsers support. This is, this is a really old screenshot. Right now it's way better. HTML5Greatness.com HTML5Greatness.com uh, shows you a cool shiny rainbow telling you uh, what's the state of the HTML5 support. But that's only for designers. For us that like to code, we have CanIUse. CanIUse.com is a website where you put in that little box whatever you want to know, how much support does it have. So I want to know how much support does video have. I write video and it says to you really, really uh, complete information about the support for that tag. Not only that, but it also tells you in case a browser that you need to support certain feature doesn't do it, in, in that case, they tell you how to make it supported. There's, there, are, there are JavaScript hacks that can do that. 
So, Internet Explorer, the main source of pain in our career. Career. May not be that. Using, as I said, shiny products that really cool people called hackers have been doing for a long, long, long time. The first one is called HTML5 enabled script. HTML5 enabled script is one line of code. One line of code. You you download at least a JS, you put it on your in a folder, and you put one line of code on the head of your website. And suddenly and magically, everything on HTML5 becomes activated in Internet Explorer 6 and 7 and 8. Semantically wise, it's really cool. It's really cool. But that's just HTML5. What happened? What happened to CSS3? Well, in CSS3, you have CSS3 Pi. CSS3 Pi. This is the website CSS3Pi.com. It's a guy that took the whole CSS3 standard and reprogrammed it in DirectX, the native code to do graphics in Microsoft Windows. That guy is crazy. God save him. Uh, uh, so you download your code and you put it on your CSS, and then what Internet Explorer does is render the standard CSS3 code that you did in DirectX on Internet Explorer. So that way you can use CSS3 in Internet Explorer. Selectivizer, Did you, do you remember about what I said, odd, even, selectors, blah, blah, blah? Well, that doesn't work in Internet Explorer itself, um, before that. But you can make it work using Selectivizer. It's a little JavaScript that activates that. And the last one of them is Modernizer. Modernizer, this is the one that you have to remember. Modernizer takes everything that I just showed you and put it in a little box that you can put in your website. You download a little zip, you put it on your website, you link it in the head tag, uh, inside the head tag of your website, and everything gets activated in other browsers. It's really easy. It's as easy as that. So really, you can use HTML5 right now. You don't need to worry about anything. But obviously, a lot of people say that no, that's not true because Internet Explorer, blah blah blah. But really, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump here and tell you about in in Latin America, we don't have the same level of adoption of technologies that you have here in the U.S. Except in the software world, for some reason, we in Latin America always have the latest Windows 7, the latest the latest OS, the latest browser. Uh, I personally think that it's because for a lot of people in Latin America, software doesn't cost money. <laughs> we, we, we don't really perceive software as something that we need to pay for. Actually, if, and this is true, if you're, yeah? Neither is totally free open source software here. Obviously, and, 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 and that's absolutely fine. That's really cool. But in the general population of Latin America, they, they, I have never met anyone at all, I, and I have met a lot of people, I've been, I've been Lucky, and I mean, I I mean a lot of people. They, I have never met anyone that pays for software, <laughs> except if they are working in a really huge company, and I mean a thousand or more workers. That's that's when people can and say, hey, what what do you have in software? But besides from that, they never pay. Never, never. They use Windows, obviously, and they use Mac and they use blah blah blah, and they never pay. So we have the fastest adoption of Windows 8, of Windows 7, of new Internet Explorers. And for example, I'm gonna skip through this right now. Sorry, that was the name. Blah blah blah. Internet Explorer six and seven in Latin America have just six point six percent of the general market. It's really slow. And actually, look at this. Really hard. Sorry. No, not this one. This one. Internet Explorer is the main browser in Latin America, but not by much. The second browser is Chrome, and obviously in the U.S. this is way better. Way way better. So as I said, you're really lucky, and if you do a uh, USB-based product, you need to buy a Internet Explorer. <laughs> it's fine. But blah 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 blah. No, no, no Internet Explorer is still important. Blah blah blah. Even Inter even Microsoft is trying to tell you to stop developing for Internet Explorer. This is a Microsoft website, ie6countdown.com. It tracks the use of Internet Explorer around the world and sends a little message. Please, for the love of God, stop developing websites for Internet Explorer 6. <laughs> and it's from Microsoft. <laughs> so even they, even they. To finish this, to really finish this, I'm really letting you go home. Sorry about that. I want, to remember, I want you to remember that we live in the future and that we live in an amazing time. This is an amazing time where people don't use the internet with these ugly things, with, with big, huge, weird computers. I love them because I grow with them. 
But the reality is that, for example, my, my, my grandmother didn't know anything about computers because she didn't even understand the concept of a computer. She thought it was a dynamic TV all, 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 his, all her life. And, and now that we have these things, now that we have touch, touch is way more important than a lot of you think. Touch really changed the way we use computing in the world. The world changed because of that. And that's because touch brought computing to humans. Before of that, we had the computing way, way far. We had the screen over there, three kilometers over there. And to, to use that screen, we needed to use a keyboard and a mouse, something that metaphorically changed our real world interactions to little colors in a screen. And that didn't make any sense. And now, we have touch screens in a lot of flavors, but when I do this, they change. When I move this, please don't see my change. All right. When I do this, it changes automatically, immediately. It gives immediate feedback, and it looks like the real world. Have you noticed that a lot of older people, a lot of non-technical people, love their iPads, love their Androids? They they really use computing now they don't now that they don't need to think about it. Now that they, it, look, it only looks like a magazine, but that you touch and that it breaks if you really crack the car. Uh, and that's, that's incredible to me. That's incredible. Touch was a real revolution. And I'm really excited to see what glass, for example, is going to bring to the world. Really, really excited. In, in, so excited that I bought one, even though it's really expensive. I don't know when I'm going to get it. But, but I love to live in the future. I love to live in the future. And that's all I wanted to say to you. HTML5 right now is the way to build the future. Um, I hope you liked this presentation. I hope my English wasn't too weird. And I hope to see you again sometime I'm back in San Francisco. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, if you want the presentation, if you, want, if you want to get the presentation in your email, uh, we have this website. This, I can hear this, this little site. Ah! The keyword is in Spanish. All right. Mejorando the way slash hola. That's the way you say hi in Spanish. Uh, we will send you all this key. Or you can give me a USB key. Freddy, what's the uh, dot LA, it's uh, the Z. Improving it. Uh, this is uh, improving the height in English. So which country is LA? Ah, LA? Laos. Laos. I really hope a cataclysm doesn't kill that <laughs> island because then we will lose our, our domain. Yeah, but it's not about a country. It's because it sounds like improving it. Mejorando dot LA, mejorando la, it sounds like improving it. So, I'm really sorry to have taken so much time, and I'm really hoping that you enjoy it. If you have any questions, I'm going to stick around for a little while, and thank you very much.